Test 3 Instructions You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 of your booklet. In this section, you will hear part of a lecture on child language acquisition. First, look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen and complete the notes in the numbered spaces 1 to 10. Today, in our series of lectures on human language, we're going to be looking at the way in which children acquire language. The study of how people learn to speak has proved to be one of the most fascinating, important and complex branches of language study. So, let's look at these three features in turn. Firstly, why is it fascinating? This stems from the natural interest people take in the developing abilities of young children. People are fascinated by the way in which children learn, particularly their own children. Secondly, it is important to study how we acquire our first language, because the study of child language can lead us to a greater understanding of language as a whole. The third point is that it's a complex study. And this is because of the enormous difficulties that are encountered by researchers as soon as they attempt to explain language development, especially in the very young child. In today's lecture, we will cover a number of topics. We will start by talking about research methods. There are a number of ways that researchers have investigated children's language, and these include the use of diaries, recordings and tests and we'll be looking at how researchers make use of these various methods. We will then go on to examine the language learning process, starting with the development of speech in young infants during the first year of life. This is the time associated with the emergence of the skills of speech perception, in other words, an emergence of the child's awareness of his or her own ability to speak. We will continue with our examination of the language learning process, this time by looking at language learning in the older child, that is, in children under five. As they mature, it's possible to begin analysis in conventional linguistic terms. And so, in our analysis, we will look at phonological, grammatical and semantic development in preschool children. In the second part of the talk, I would like to review some educational approaches to the question of how linguistic skills can be developed. In other words, how can we assist the young child to learn language skills at school? Initially, we will look at issues that arise in relation to spoken language. We will then look at reading and review a number of approaches that have been proposed in relation to the teaching of reading. Finally, we will conclude today's talk with an account of current thinking about the most neglected area of all, the child's developing awareness of written language. Now turn to section 2, on page 10. Section 2. You will hear a talk on New Zealand radio about an art sale which is being held to raise money for charity. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13 on page 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. One of the most anticipated art events in Christchurch is the Charity Art Sale, organised this year by Neil Curtis. Neil, tell us all about it. Well, Diane, this looks like being the biggest art sale yet. And the best thing about it is that the money raised will all go to charity. So what you probably want to know first is where it is. Well, the pictures will be on view all this week, most of them at the Star Gallery in the shopping mall. But we have so many pictures this year that we're also showing some in the cafe next door. So do drop in and see them any day between 9 and 5. Now, if you're interested in buying rather than just looking, and we hope a lot of you will be, the actual sale will take place on Thursday evening, with sales starting at 730 Refreshments will be available before the sale, starting at 6.30. We've got about 50 works by local artists showing a huge range of styles and media, and in a minute I'll tell you about some of them. You're probably also interested in what's going to happen to your money once you've handed it over. Well, all proceeds will go to support children who are disabled, both here in New Zealand and also in other countries so you can find an original painting, support local talent and help these children all at the same time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20 on page 11. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Now, let me tell you a bit about some of the artists who have kindly agreed to donate their pictures to the charity art sale. One of them is Don Studley, who has a special interest in the art sale because his five-year-old daughter was born with a serious back problem. After an operation earlier this year, She's now doing fine, but Don says he wants to offer something to help other less fortunate children. Don is totally self-taught and says he's passionate about painting. His paintings depict some of our New Zealand birds in their natural habitats. One relative newcomer to New Zealand is James Chang, who came here from Taiwan nine years ago at the age of 56. Mr Chang had 13 exhibitions in Taiwan before he came to live here in Christchurch, so he's a well-established artist, and art has been a lifelong passion for him. His paintings are certainly worth looking at. If you like abstract pictures with strong colour schemes, you'll love them. Natalie Stevens was born in New Zealand, but is exhibited in China, Australia and Spain. As well as being an artist, she's a website designer. She believes art should be universal, and her paintings use soft colours and a mixture of media. Most of her pictures are portraits, so watch out. Some of them may even be friends of yours. And then we have Christine Shin from Korea. Christine only started to learn English two years ago when she arrived in New Zealand, but she's been painting professionally for over 10 years, and she sure knows how to communicate strong messages through the universal language of art. She usually works from photographs and paints delicate watercolours, which combine traditional Asian influences with New Zealand landscapes, giving a very special view of our local scenery. Well, that's all I have time to tell you now, but as well as these four, there are many other artists whose work will be on sale, so do come along on Thursday. We accept cheques, credit cards or cash. And remember, even if you don't buy a picture, you can always make a donation.
That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students and a tutor. They are talking about essays. First, look at questions 21 to 25. As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than four words or a number for each answer. So, Pamela, here's your essay. And, Carl, you've already got yours back. Anything you want to ask or any comments? Can you just go over again for us how the marks for our essays go towards our final grade? Well, um, over the year... You're meant to write five main essays for this course. Yes. And each essay is marked out of 20, which gives you a total of 100 marks. Yes. This coursework makes up 50% of your marks for the year, with the other 50% coming from the written exam. Right. So the five essays contribute to 50% of our final grade for the year. Yes. Mm. You gave me 18 out of 20 for this essay, which gives me a total of 9% towards my final grade for the year. Mm. And I want um, to... And with 14 for this one, I've got 7%. Yes, Pamela. Does that clarify it? Yes. Mm, yes. We did have it explained to us at the beginning of the course. When? In the first tutorial. OK. I think we'd better move on now. About your last essay, have either of you any questions or comments? Before the conversation continues, look at questions 26 to 30. As you listen to the next part of the talk, complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. You gave me 18 for this paper. What was the big difference between this piece and the previous one? I actually thought the first one was better. Well, there was quite a marked difference. Really? Yes. It looked as if you had actually done quite a bit of research. You had quite a lot of relevant examples, especially on the historical side. You even found some information that I was not even aware of. Your sources were also very sound. And on top of that, your answer was very well organised indeed, and the writing style was very elegant. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. I must say that it was the best piece of writing for a paper that we've seen for quite some time. I have to say, though, it took me a very long time to put it together. How long? At least two weeks. But it was well worth it. Can I just ask you if it's possible to rewrite the first essay of the term? It's really brought my average down. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. Is there no way to do it? I'm afraid not. OK, right. I'll just have to try to do better than average on the others. And Pamela? Well... To be honest, on the whole, I'm happy with my marks. Again, your research was very good. And you gave quite a long list of source material, which was very good. I spent quite a lot of time on this essay, more than the others. 
Well, again, it shows. What about the organisation? I was a bit worried about that. Your organisation, I have to say, was excellent. Oh, but as regards your style, yes, it is slightly too informal here and there.、Mm. I think you need to tighten this up a little.、Mm, okay. I only wish I'd put a bit more effort into the first one as well now. But I would like to know how I can get my marks up even higher. What do I have to do specifically? Well, your work could do with being more thoroughly checked. You have quite a few spelling mistakes. Yes, I know. If it's anything, I think it's the computer. Hmm. Well, I'm not very good at typing. Two fingers, really. And when I finish something like this, I find it difficult, even depressing, to go over it carefully again. But it's affecting your marks.、Mm. Your previous essay was much better than this one. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to follow what's being said because of the frequency of mistakes. A couple of years ago, the university authorities would have been more lenient, but now they're very hot on presentation, and have been coming down heavily on things like grammar and spelling.、Mm. In fact, I am obliged to deduct marks from every piece of work which is not handed in fairly free of mistakes. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk given by a guest lecturer in the continuing education department. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Continuing Education Department for hosting this series of lectures on people behind the names you thought were fiction. Welcome to this talk on the Grand Old Duke of York. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old nursery rhyme, "The Grand Old Duke of York, he had ten thousand men." He marched them up to the top of the hill, and he marched them down again, and so on. But did you know that the Duke of York, immortalized in this popular song, was actually Frederick Augustus, second son of King George the Third of England and Queen Charlotte? He achieved fame in this way because of the humiliation he suffered at the hands of the French during the Revolutionary Wars at the end of the eighteenth century. Frederick was born on the sixteenth of August, seventeen sixty-three, and from the age of seventeen he had been trained as a soldier. When war broke out between England and France in seventeen ninety-three, his father, the king, insisted that he should command the British contingent that was being dispatched to Flanders to cooperate with the Austrians and the Dutch. The duke was a brave soldier, but remember he was only thirty at the time. Not only was he young, but he was also inexperienced in battle, and was unable to cope with the enthusiastic French Revolutionary Army. He was let down by his allies too, and in spite of the arrival of ten thousand fresh troops from England, his campaigns were a disaster. He was driven out of Dunkirk in September 1793, Flanders in May 1794, and Belgium in July 1794. Finally, during the winter of 1794 to 1795, his army retreated to the border of Hanover, and, 
with his unsuccessful campaigns over, the Duke returned to England. It was after this military fiasco that the Duke of York came to be, rather unkindly, satirized in song. Would you believe, despite all this, King George III arranged his son's promotion to the position of Commander-in-Chief of the Army in 1798, and in the following year he was appointed to command an army sent to invade Holland. Again he was unsuccessful, and this confirmed the general opinion that he was not capable of commanding an army in the field. Nevertheless, the rhyme is a bit cruel and harsh, because it doesn't take into account the nature of the soldiers who served with Frederick. All the blame for lack of success should not have been attached to the Duke alone, because the army he had under his command was made up from what is commonly described as the scum of the earth. This is a somewhat offensive term used to refer to a group of people regarded as despicable and worthless. Who were they, these ordinary soldiers? Well, they were mostly vicious, brutal ex-convicts, or raw recruits, and elderly men. The officers who commanded them were all untrained as military men. In fact, they were anybody who could afford to buy a commission. Uh, but here's the really great thing that, unfortunately, the Duke of York is not remembered for. He realized that this was a hopeless kind of army, and he set about improving conditions in order to recruit higher-quality soldiers. He introduced padres. Are you familiar with the term? No? Well, let me explain. You see, members of the British Armed Forces are generally Christians of one denomination or another, and a padre is a Christian cleric or chaplain who ministers to the soldiers and attends to their spiritual needs without belonging to any particular grouping within the Christian faith. Now, where was I? Yes, Frederick introduced padres, doctors, and veterinary surgeons to the battlefield. Why vets? To attend to the horses, of course. Remember, we're talking about late 18th century battlefields. He was also the founder of the Royal Military College for the Training of Officers at Sandhurst. Yes, the very same one where the princes and other members of the royal family receive their military training today. Frederick also founded the Duke of York's school in London for sons of soldiers killed in battle. His name is perhaps better commemorated by this school in Chelsea than by the column that stands at the top of Waterloo Steps in St. James's Park. In 1807, the Duke was involved in a scandal with a woman and, as a result, resigned as Commander-in-Chief but he was reinstated in 1811 by his elder brother, the Prince Regent, who later became George IV of England. He continued in this post until his death in 1827. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.